Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. A little later, we're going to talk about farming, what it means to Colorado. But first, a friend of mine who's spent his career communicating the ideas of liberty, both in the classroom and now on books. Congratulations, Tom Cranowitter. Thank you, John, very much. That's the worst last name of anybody I know. Long in German, isn't Long it? Long in German. Yeah. Hey, the reason I wanted to talk with you is that so often I'm in these conversations and we're talking about freedom, we're talking about liberty, and it's hard to separate philosophy from politics. And they get really muddled up in that, you know, we get into these political fights, and I see more of the takings coalition who wants more government money and they want to transfer wealth, and that's politics, but it's also collectivism, and there's a philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if people quite understand that there's a difference between philosophy and politics, philosophy first, and then comes politics, and that really this idea of what we call libertarianism, some people call it objectivism, some other call it just free markets, is a holistic philosophy, a holistic theory, and not just a bunch of mean capitalists who want to make a lot of money. You've done a lot of work kind of explaining the philosophy of this. Give me, give me, give me a brief history lesson. Yeah, it, it is a, it's a complete way, a comprehensive way of looking at the world. If we, uh, we'll do a little quick survey here of some 3,000 years of ideas and philosophy compressed into a few minutes. The ancient way of thinking about politics, human societies, and when I say ancient, I mean uh, the ideas you find if you read Plato, Aristotle, the the, yes, the yeah. ancient Greeks. Their argument is that the, the highest purpose of government is to form the soul of human beings in just the right way, to transform human beings into virtuous beings. And then along comes a, 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 the first worldwide religion, Christianity, that spread throughout the Western world. And what, what Christian politicians did, priests, others, popes, is they took that ancient view of let's try to make men and women virtuous and they translated the meaning of virtue into Christian. To be virtuous from a Christian point of view means that's very Christian. To be Christian, right? And what this actually gave rise to was uh, uh, centuries of religious persecution. Because now all of a sudden if someone is accused of of inadequate piety or worshiping the wrong way or worshiping the wrong religion or the wrong set of gods, uh, their soul is in jeopardy. They're certainly not being virtuous. So we need government to come along and censor speech, censor religion, punish people when they're not praying the right way. When you say government, and, could you also be meaning uh, culture as well in that a, a when the church was was government, there really was no there was no separation between the church and the state. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, the Vatican, for example, at one time had the largest army on the face of the planet. Uh, it, 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 sure. what, it, it was a church, it was the spiritual authority, and it was a government in every sense of, of that word. And the, you're right, there was no separation between church and state. That's going to be another important development when we get to our philosophy of, of liberty. Uh, I, I give credit to one of the most important thinkers who observed all of this was a, a medieval Italian Renaissance thinker named Machiavelli. And Machiavelli looked at the world and he said, this is horrible. Uh, people are, are, he used this phrase, pious cruelty. They're engaged in you know, cruelty, unbelievable cruelty, including torture and execution in the name of their pious religious beliefs. And Machiavelli's critique could be summed up in this way. He said, what, what has happened, the, the politicization of religion, using religion as the authority for government, for laws and armies and police forces, it has made citizens really hard in the areas they should be soft, and it has made them soft in the areas they should be how hard. Do you, how do you mean that? And here's what, here's what he meant. When, uh, for example, when there's an invading army, Machiavelli taught what you want is your citizens to stand up and fight. And the problem with many Christian soldiers is they think they should turn the other cheek and extend love and caring and forgiveness to their enemy. 
that, that's an instance of being soft when they really should be hard, firm. And at the same time, they should be firm and gentle, and forgiving, uh, very tolerant of their neighbors. But instead, what they're doing is they're turning their neighbors in because they they're didn't. Not Christian they're enough not Christian enough. Right. They didn't go to whatever. And he, so, so Machiavelli's solution was, and, and this sounds really simple, and yet it was revolutionary. It was, let's lower the goal of politics. Rather than having government try to perfect human nature somehow or produce virtuous or pious citizens, how about if the purpose of government was simply securing individuals in their freedom? And then if they want to be pious, if they want to work on their relationship with God, or they want to work on their virtue and they want to improve themselves, they're free to do that. But that's not going to be the purpose of government. It's a kind of lowering of the sights, of the goals of government. And I would argue... The, the, the first time somebody <laughs> says, we need a separation between church and state. Yes. There's role for government. We, we need our armies. We need our roads. There's a role for religion. We need to answer the tough questions of life. And, uh, but they don't have to be connected. In, in fact, he went so far as to say it's highly dangerous when they are connected. It's much better to separate these things, right? So that we'll have this government that is over here securing uh, property individual freedom and sometimes that requires things like an army so you want that government to be very limited to focus on those few things and then things like improving your 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 spiritual life and your relationship with god that that will be that will be the role of the church this gives rise to a whole new kind of political philosophy that had never existed before and some of the great minds of the modern period start thinking through, well, what does this mean if government really focuses on securing the individual and his or her property and person? And this is how we get thinkers like John Locke, uh, uh, Algin and Sidney, many of the thinkers that were highly influential in the American founding. And, and I would say that the American founding represents a kind of culmination, uh, an Perfection is too strong of a word, but it was almost a perfection of this trend of modern political philosophy of thinking through uh, how do you create a government? What is the authority? How do you make a government legitimate whose only purpose is to secure the person and property of citizens? And the founders came along and they said, well, there's, there's one answer to that. There's one legitimate foundation for that kind of government, the consent of the governed. And that, too, was revolutionary. Before the American founding and a handful of thinkers before the, the early Americans, uh, everyone thought that the foundation for a government came was from... A, was, a, was a tough man. W w w well, or, or came from God, usually. Through, through the tough man. Exactly. Through the king, right? through and the so, tyrant. And, and, and that's the rule of unelected kings. And the Americans said, no, we reject all of that. We think that every human being is equal in a really important way that they own themselves. They own their person and their property. And therefore, if you're going to rule someone else, you need to get their consent. You need to ask their permission. I, I think you, you, you nail that thought, which is our philosophy is that the individual is sovereign, that the individual is a country unto him or herself and that uh, that person by natural law has these rights and if you want to mess with them you need this idea of, of, of consent. Bring it uh, as close as you can to today's pol political divide then. Yeah. So, you know, um, often, as I said, this philosophy gets messed up with, with, with politics and then we get identity politics and we get all yeah. this. What is that philosophy that you just explained what does it look like today? How, do, how would you explain it in a way that gets people a, a foundation before they go off and, and choose how they want to do politics? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give a kind of contrast. So where we are today, we live in a, a regime where many people believe that government is ultimately responsible for everything. Everything. Name a problem. Maybe it's My a, leg hurts. Anything. Your, your health care. That's government's job I to, like to make I, you healthy. My home is right? too expensive. Everything. Uh, where you work, how much you get paid, your food, your medicine, the education of your children, right? There are many people who think government is responsible for everything. everything. Therefore, we should remove all limits on government power. Now, the, the problem with that, that's why every subject has become politicized. Because 
any problem. It, maybe it's not even a problem. Maybe it's just an interesting observation about the world that, that, that some scientists might want to look at and study that immediately becomes politicized because there are people out there thinking, well, this is, this is government's roles to manage this or take care of this. The old way of thinking, the American way, or the way that came out of the American founding was, government does one, one thing, make sure that we're secure in our person and our property, and other than that, it wishes people good luck. If you want to see a model today of what old-fashioned, constitutional, limited government looks like, I would recommend to your viewers that they pay attention to their local county sheriff. Most sheriffs, and I'm talking about the sheriffs who do a good job, right? Who are elected in who, this state. Who are elected, in that sense, they're constitutional officers. And their job is to make sure that the citizens around them are secure in their person and property. And when there is no stealing going on, there's no raping, there's no murder, everyone is secure in their home, what does the sheriff do at that moment? He wishes everyone good luck, you know, doing it with their lives, whatever they want to do, and he stays out of people's way. You That's see this, the old-fashioned way of thinking about government. You see this in small things as well. You know, I live in Boulder because I want to. I want to see the other side up close. Yeah. I don't like going to a smoky restaurant. Most people don't like going to a smoky restaurant. Some people do. What does Boulder do? And then the whole state says. That's a, that's a governmental problem, right? Now, instead of the power of relationships, this is a governmental problem, and now nowhere in Colorado can you have a beer and a cigarette and a steak. There's, there's, there's not a gay bar, there's not a fern bar, there's not a jazz bar, there's not a blues bar, there's not a biker bar, right. where people who want to have that mutual experience are free to do that because other people said this is a governmental issue. Right. And, 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 of course, then... For, for your own health, but really was for my con my convenience. Well, and l let me let me take this in a little different direction about uh, move away from the subject of freedom and liberty toward helping people. If we really care about helping people, and this ultimately is why I care about freedom and liberty, because I love to see human beings flourish and thrive. I, I, I it, it's a terrible thing to see human beings suffer from from any kind of pain. The Americans found this wonderful solution by protecting people in their person and their property. It unleashed a wave of entrepreneurial creativity and innovation of which there is no parallel in, in all of human history. The Americans created enormous amounts of wealth. And what did they do with that wealth? They helped each other all the time. Even people who were genuinely needy, who, you know, something terrible happened, a lightning hit their house and it burned down, or they had some terrible disease, or, 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 or whatever the problem was, citizens would ask each other for help. And because they were productive and they were creating wealth, they were able to help each other in all kinds of ways, and they did. And that kind of voluntary assistance fueled this wonderful incentive system where people wanted to help their neighbors. Those who received wanted to pay back. So as soon as they could, they got busy being productive so that they could pay off their debts. And we replaced that with a nationalized government kind of assistance program where all of those incentives where, are gone. Instead of you giving, we come and take and then redistribute. Yes. All right, uh, listen, we're over time, but let me ask one more question. Okay. That all sounds wonderful. That's just adorable, Tom. Really, it's it's it's. And I thank you for the history lesson. But you know the problem with you people, you don't understand there are roles for the government. You know, if it were up to you, we wouldn't have fire departments. We we would, people would be dying in the streets. You know, you absolutists don't understand that there are real human needs out there. There are people taking advantage of one another. Uh, listen, I want to go to a restaurant that I know has been certified to be safe to go to a restaurant. <laughs> and you guys, yeah, that, that's really clever. That's wonderful. It's not 250 years ago. It's today. Come on. Right. Well, and, and what we're doing today is we are still um, eating away at the seed that we built up, that we developed through 200 years of relatively free society. And we're giving that away. The very conditions that allowed us to prosper and grow so much, we're chipping away at it a little piece at a time, little, 
always in the name of safety, keeping people safe from some kind of threat, and it doesn't really matter if the threat is real or exaggerated or imagined. That's the excuse that's always used to take away people's freedom in, in the name of regulating their person and their property. And we're going down a bad path if we continue. By the way, you just put out a, a book that's available. I love Save the Swamp. Yes, sir. All right, real, real <laughs> fast, take 10 seconds. What is Save the Swamp? It's a work of satire, it's a parody, and I'm giving advice to bureaucrats on how to thrive and make more money and harass more citizens. That'll be terrific. And <laughs> available on Amazon, I hope? Available on Amazon.com. Tom, it's always great. Thank you for helping with that clarity. Thank you, John. Stay tuned.